My fellow citizens, good morning. It's uh, Saturday, the uh, uh, 11th of uh, July. It's been a long night with not much sleep for many of us, but we still felt it was worth the effort uh, to get up at uh, early enough uh, to do this, uh, this dialogue on the events of 10th July, uh, 2020. Uh, I'm uh, very, very happy to, to have on this Academia.sg panel uh, a group of authors and editors of a forthcoming volume uh, that will focus on uh, GE 2020. Um, and we're going to jump right in because I don't think the subject uh, needs any introduction and uh, talk about um, the, uh, the, what our panelists made of yesterday's um, results. Uh, just so that nobody gets away with, um, you know, the, the wisdom of hindsight, I, I pinned our panelists down yesterday and asked them, uh, what do you expect the results uh, to be? Uh, and I forced a prediction out of each of them. And the predictions uh, were for the PAP to win, uh, <laughs> but that they would lose uh, six to eight seats so there was, in fact, a kind of an academic consensus among the five of us. Uh, we predicted the PAP would lose six to eight seats with a 64 to 65% vote share. So talk about groupthink. There wasn't, in fact, much <laughs> divergence <laughs> in this particular group. Uh, as it turned out, the opposition ended up uh, beating our expectations, not by much, but still significantly. Uh, so my first question really is how big a surprise uh, was this. Um, Kevin, shall we start with you? Thanks very much, Charian. Uh, I think it was uh, a surprise only in so far as um, uh, if you look at this set of results versus what happened in 2015, right? Uh, so 2015 was an extraordinary election when they actually uh, gain a large number of votes, something like you know seven percent or eight percent more than what they did uh, prior to that in 2011. So if one looks at the trajectory from 2011 to today, actually we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, of course, uh, there are the usual uh, 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 points that have been made about flight to safety, for example, whether or not you know people would run. Uh, back to the PAP as they, uh, and vote for them in the way that they did uh, in 2015. So yes, it was a kind of a surprise, mm. um, uh, but not so much if one uh, took a dispassionate look and looked at the trends uh, that were emerging already from 2011. Yeah. Sharon, your mic. Sharon. You're muted. <laughs> Uh, Priscilla, how about you? Thanks so much, Charian. Um, I think likewise, I've, I, for me, it was quite a surprise. And I think a few surprising trends stood out for me. There's the swing to Sinkang, for, to the WP. Um, the general swing towards the opposition, you're looking about 5 to maybe 8%. And it, when the results started coming in, it really felt like 20, GE 2011 feelings came back again. So I think um, the start of the, at the start of polling day, there was quite a lot of nervousness as to how the opposition would fare. I think with this election, it is truly unprecedented. COVID is unexpected. There are a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty, certainties surrounding these elections. So um, I guess the question now is 2011, we saw the swing to the opposition, 2015 back to the PEP. Today, back swing another swing to the opposition so what what the trajectory might mean for the opposition for the pp moving forward in the next decade yeah. uh terence yes um good morning everyone and thank you Charin, for hosting this and sharing this um i i'll pick up from um from kevin's comments about the surprise i think look definitely i've, I've by and large most Singaporeans were surprised by the outcome. Um, the nature of the surprise, however, is a bit different from, um, the, the, from 2011. Um, Kevin and myself has had the privilege of working on um, two books prior to this, 2011 and 2015. 
and I think the, um, the, the term back in 2011 was the new normal, right? Um, everyone was talking about how this was a water sh- that was a watershed election. Um, what we're seeing is a continuity, a continuation of that, uh, what happened back in 2011. Um, minus, I think importantly, minus uh, palpable anger amongst the, the voters. Um, perhaps there was anger within, but you know, we couldn't feel the pulse because of the way um, this election was run, you know, this COVID-19 election. Uh, my, my suspicion is that people are starting to think a bit more about what they want um, out of the government. And by the government, I also mean um, the opposition on the other side. So I think we're, you know, in, in that regard, uh, we should not be surprised. But nevertheless, uh, because of the inability to gauge what was going to happen, I think there was surprises all around. Yeah, I think definitely uh, it was a surprise um, result that uh, for all of us. And I think particularly with regards to Sengkang, I think if you ask most people before the elections, you know, if they would take a bet uh, whether PAP will win Sengkang or not, I think most people will bet uh, the PAP winning Sengkang. So the WP's uh, winning Sengkang with 52% of the votes uh, is quite impressive and definitely a surprise. I would like to also add on to uh, Terence's comment about um, being unable to feel the palpable anger on the ground, uh, which was quite evident in the 2011 general elections. I think in this general elections, it appears to me that there's uh, definitely not so much of anger, but more of frustration, right? And the frustration being that um, voters really, really looking forward to uh, debating about policies, uh, how to move forward beyond the post-COVID uh, future, um, and looking to have more inclusivity in terms of the different viewpoints uh, where policy debates were happening. But what happened during the campaign was that there were a lot of, uh, still a lot of personality uh, attacks and. Um, some would say character assassinations uh, uh, both ways, right? So, so I, my sense is that a lot of voters were very frustrated with the entire campaign. People were disappointed at how the campaign turned out. Um, so that was much more uh, palpable, at least online, uh, as compared to anger in 2011. Okay, um, you raised a very important point about the negativity in the campaign, which was a key theme that was brought up by uh, those who registered for this webinar in their registration form. So we do, we do want to spend a bit of more time about that. But sticking to the um, specific Senkang race, uh, I should say that although our predictions yesterday uh, were pretty close to the eventual outcome, yeah, uh, we predicted uh, uh, six to eight seats uh, uh, falling to the um, to the opposition. Uh, no, none of us predicted a wipeout. Uh, all of us predicted that the Workers Party would train uh, uh, would keep its seats. Uh, the only question is whether it would add a, a few more. And um, in all humility, as Elvin said, uh, not one of the five of us. Uh, said that Senkang would fall. Yeah. So, so this was a surprise to us. It may not be. It may not have been a big surprise to uh, you know many people in the audience, but it was a surprise to us. Uh, so, uh, I think it, it will take some time to figure out what exactly happened in that uh, uh, GRC. I wonder if uh, any of you have some uh, preliminary thoughts, Priscilla, for example. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in, jump into kind of, um, I, I think Sengkang for me is very interesting because this is my ward and I have been voting since 2011 um, in this ward. So um, I think it's still a bit early to kind of uh, figure out what happened in Sengkang. But I think what would be interesting, what is interesting is to look historically how Sengkang and that area has voted. So if we look at Sengkang um, GRC as it stands now, it, what it encompasses um, quite a bit of former Sengkang West GRC, Pongo East SMC, and a bit of Pasiris Pongo GRC. And I say this area is it, it's a little under the radar, but has been quite a stronghold for WP. Because if we look at the 2015 results, um, Against the national swing, you are looking at Pongo East having about 
48%. And then you are also looking at Sengkang West and SMC look at about 38% to the WP and even higher in the 2011 um, elections. So you do have, um, you, you do see uh, that the WP is a very familiar branding here in Sengkang, Pongo East area. And um, of course, Sengkang is a relatively young constituency compared to many others who um, might fit the type of profiles or the target audiences or might align themselves more with the WP uh, candidates which are young, who are younger and um, rep quite representative of the constituency here in Sinkam. So perhaps um, um, moving ahead, I think um, perhaps the WP will be looking to try to consolidate and build their regional, regional identity here in Sinkam. And I think as the, and of course, it's not going to be a guarantee that they will continue to hold Sinkang GRC, especially when we saw what happened with Pongo East. So I think a lot remains to be seen and determined. Uh, Kevin? Yes, thanks, Sharon. Um, to be fair to all of us, I think uh, everyone did predict that uh, Sengkang would be a close fight. Um, none of us predicted that they would win Sengkang, but everyone said it would be a fight to watch. And, and let me explain why I think th this is important in sort of structural terms. Whenever you create a new constituency, uh, there is always a danger that uh, this constituency uh, would adopt a new identity of its own, even though it may have been made of composite parts of various old constituencies before. So I want to make a couple of points relating to this. One, which is the drawing of electoral boundaries. One tendency has always been uh, that in the drawing of electoral boundary lines, those wards that did not fare too well with the PAP in that particular election tend to be either absorbed, redrawn, or uh, somehow redraw, uh, 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 reconfigured. Uh, and, and this represents, um, well, one could say, well, you're gerrymandering, so you kind of uh, want to dissipate the dissent. That's one way of looking at it. But you also create something new, which doesn't then have the baggage of the old. So when you send a new team there, you're actually, uh, if you were the opposition, you are actually on a far more level playing field than a team that's been there as an incumbent. Now, we can see the power of incumbency, for example, in Haokang, uh, SMC, in Aljunit. Right? If you don't touch those boundaries too much, incumbency has its great advantages. But the moment you create a new constituency, a new identity emerges, and then it depends on how you play your cards. And I think we shouldn't take away the fact that the Workers' Party played a brilliant uh, uh, strategy in so far as Sengkang is concerned, right? A new, younger electorate, uh, probably better educated than in some of the older estates, uh, much more savvy, understand uh, the nuances of government, they do understand the difference between what the national government does on the one hand and what municipal government does on the other hand. So if you go out there and you say, I'm going to give you a playground and thanks to us, you know, you're going to have a road here. I think people have sort of realized that, hey, come on, there is a national plan. It's not just a Sengkang plan. It's a national plan. There are roads, there are MRTs, there are HDB flats and commercial spaces and so on. So you, you can't really take too much credit for that. So keep if you keep barking up that tree, people are going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and, and, and the Workers' Party supplied that, and then, right? And they, they, they had a brilliant campaign. Young uh, uh, candidates uh, immediately trying to dovetail their own identities with that of the uh, young parents, young families who live in Sengkang, uh, and then, you know, sort of connected at that level. So I think that made uh, uh, some difference. That's helpful because I think it, it um, identifies some of the sort of the structural uh, issues at play in a ward like um, Sengkang, as well as some of the sort of the X-factor um, 
you know, uh, particularities of this particular contest, which I think is a good way to look at any uh, um, any contest. I wonder if any of you would like to uh, elaborate on this mix of uh, sort of uh, underlying secular tendencies versus what's really new in the uh, in the campaign. With particular reference to uh, to Senkan for a start. I mean, I think I if if I could just venture one fairly uh, obvious point, uh, it would be that uh, the uh, electorate seems to be um, looking for the sweet spot, right? Uh, you know, what is the right uh, amount of opposition that will provide a check on the PAP? Um, uncomfortable with too much uncomfortable with too little uh, and the precise uh, number of votes in any one constituency seems to be affected uh, pri according to several scholars primarily by perceived credibility for example I mean would that uh, would that be a, a crude but generally accurate summary of the literature out there on voting patterns uh, Elvin? Yeah, so maybe here uh, I can answer the question more specifically. With regards to um, the general voting population, I would say, and also uh, maybe in particular with Senkang, one can put, one can sort of characterize the moderate median voter in Singapore uh, having the political preference of, number one, they want the PAP to still be in power, but number two, they would like to see more opposition voices. Uh, to potentially challenge the PAP much more in Parliament, right? So that is some sort of a moderate median voter. Now, the question then is, um, when it comes to the local, um, the local opposition party that is contesting in the district, uh, then these moderate median voters will have to think very hard about whether to vote for the particular opposition party in that candidate or not. Uh, uh, in their constituency or not. And as Charon, you mentioned, uh, the academic literature out there has suggested that uh, party credibility is a very important factor uh, as uh, compared to other um, important factors uh, in driving opposition vote share, right? Uh, so party credibility is this perceived notion that uh, opposition parties will be able to, number one, manage the town council effectively, professionally, uh, if they do get into power, and number two, to be able to uh, also exhibit professionalism in credibility in challenging the PAP in parliament and maybe not make a fool of themselves, right? Um, and people infer these party credibility from a wide range of indicators. They look at who the leader of the party is, they look at uh, the consistency of the grassroots outreach, um, and they look at the consistency of uh, the party brand, whether they have a consistent messaging or not. Um, and reflective of this uh, sense of party credibility, uh, I did a little calculation of the vote shares of the three major uh, opposition parties uh, in their constituencies that they contested in. So Workers' Party vote share, PSP vote share, and SDP vote share. And um, obviously, Workers' Party vote share uh, in all the areas that it contested was uh, the best. So their vote share was 49.5%, if my calculations are correct, right? So that includes uh, East Coast and Marine Parade and Pongo West, which they lost, right? So 49.5%, so almost 50% uh, the, for the Workers' Party vote share. Um, and the second best, surprisingly, is PSP. Right, uh, PSP in all the places it contested uh, was forty point eight percent vote share. Right, so um, so what Tan Ching Bok mentioned yesterday was correct that the their vote share in all the places was around forty percent. And surprisingly, coming in third place was SDP. Their vote share, their uh, in the constituencies that they contested in was thirty seven percent. Right, so uh, it's quite surprising that PSP managed to uh, do better than SDP, given that. SDP has a long reputation as an opposition party, but I guess the PSP um, credibility was definitely boosted with Dr. Tan Ching Bok. So I think overall, um, people are definitely looking at party credibility from a wide range of indicators, uh, but particularly with regards to, say, Sengkang winning, um, 
I think that has to do a little bit more of the local dynamics as Kevin mentioned. Uh, and yeah, Kevin mentioned. Well, the, the contrast between SDP and PSP that he mentioned is interesting, mm -hmm. how, how uh, uh, quickly uh, PSP has come up. But I suppose one other way to look at it is that they're actually going after uh, a different set of voters, right? That the mm -hmm. PSP would, uh, you would assume, be most attractive to the swing voter who has previously voted for the PAP which in fact would not be the kind of uh, uh, the profile of the, uh, the SDP supporter or the, the group that the SDP courts. Yeah. Uh, that, that is something I guess that would need to, um, we need to look at more closely. Well, uh, very quickly, the SDP might, uh, I would say the typical SDP voter might not be the typical uh, PSP voter, but uh, in terms of who they are trying to attract, um, I think they, my sense is that they are both trying to attract the, 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 the same kind of moderate medium voter. They want to be able to persuade people who have previously voted for the PAP uh, to vote for them instead uh, in, this, uh, in order to win right, a majority. So it's always about that voter that gives you the 50th, 51st, 52nd uh, percent uh, in your constituency. So... Um, I think all parties are trying to get at that median voter, uh, but it's, um, of course, the typical uh, uh, stereotype of the PSP voter and the SDP voter may, may not be the same. Actually, um, one of the things that uh, I observed from uh, way back in the 2011 election uh, is that, you, you know, in a place where politics is not terribly ideological. You don't have parties that are, you know, from really diverse uh, 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 ideological camps. You're actually uh, fighting for a very, very tiny sliver of the center. The center is not as wide as it would be. So you know that on either end of the spectrum, there will be 25% hardcore pro-PAP, 25% hardcore anti-PAP, and then there's sort of a middle vote. But that middle, uh, ideologically, that middle is a lot narrower than the numbers suggest, right? So what that middle, that middle moderate, as Elvin put it, what are they actually looking for? And this is beginning to look very um, interesting because you see now almost the emergence of a two-party system, which is what the yes. Westminster system was designed to be, right? Uh, where your choices are not so stark where uh, you actually uh, look at the other side and say, well, uh, it's a party that is credible like me. It is as capable as I am. Uh, they are not so ideological different that are, you know, uh, uh, I, I could switch. I could actually cross the floor for that party. I, I, I actually can identify uh, with that party. So, so the greatest success that the PAP has had in all these 60 years, has actually been Im implanting into the Singaporean mindset that they are looking for a PAP-like party, a party that espouses those values that PAP stood for. It is really interesting for me to see in this election, you know, almost every opposition party uh, quoting lines from Lee Kuan Yew. I mean, he's become almost like a godfather <laughs> even for the opposition, right? Uh, and, 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 and let's not even talk about the Lee Sien Yang factor. But, you know, uh, what is it that uh, uh, political parties as, aspire to do? It is because they see this connection with a particular idealistic uh, version of what uh, party politics should be. Can, can I jump in here? Um, I was just thinking along the same lines as, as Kevin, because we talked about Seng Kang, you know, appealing to the young voters, having um, you know, the, the, the MPs themselves, the elected MPs themselves, um, rather synonymous in terms of you know, where they're at in this, at their face of life. But I think also there is that broader, um, for want of a better word, pragmatism. And we talk about Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew's brand of pragmatism that's been ingrained um, on Singaporeans, uh, including those who have left the shores, uh, <laughs> such, such as myself. Um, it's... it's um, I think the pragmatism comes into play here because they see where they want the future of Singapore to go. So it's not just about the immediate present moment because if the immediate present moment can be appealed with you know, upgrading and, and the playgrounds that, that Kevin talked about as well. Um, 
So I think that there's the element of that, you know, beyond the constituency itself uh, that has swung those middle ground voters. And I, I would say that, you know, their ideology is entirely pragmatic. In other words, they can go either slightly left or slightly right or stay exactly cent central, right? Uh, exactly centrist. So it's, um, I, I think we cannot discount those sorts of uh, mentalities amongst the voters. Uh, Terence, I want to stick with you uh, because uh, one of the, the most interesting uh, features of this uh, election was, of course, the fact that it was more media reliant than any election in history. Yes. Yeah, and a number of um, our audience members have asked us questions about this, uh, ranging from questions about the mainstream media. Uh, so, uh, Rasandran. Uh, points out that you know modern elected democracies need diverse newspapers and publications that allow unfettered constructive analysis. How can this be sustained? Um, uh, another uh, viewer asks, um, how can the opposition spread its word out effectively in this election? And makes the good point that uh, uh, you know that many of us in fact rely on uh, WhatsApp. Facebook groups, uh, when we talk about social media communication, but that of course only preaches to the converted, we think. Yeah, maybe it doesn't, but uh, it seems to make sense that it's actually not the ideal medium for no, um, yeah. the opposition parties to reach out to the middle ground, so to speak. And of course, it's heavy reliance on, on social media. So this is media. not the first internet election, it's not even the first social media, no, 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 no. Yeah. the first YouTube election, but yeah, it's. <laughs> Different, doesn't it? So, so what, what do you make of that? Look, it's look. There's there's so much to analyze. Um, you know, we can keep doing it until the next election and beyond. Um, but you're right, Charin, in terms of calling this an internet election. I think back in 2006, the term was already thrown out. You know, this is the internet election, right? And then again, 2011, again 2015. I think you you could say that it has the use of the internet, social media has reached a point where you know, it's widespread, there's beyond critical mass now. What's ironic about this particular election is that because it's the pandemic election, the, the amendment to the, to, to the election act to allow this election to happen uh, has pointed everyone to the internet. And as a result, you know, um, we've, we've had the ability to, to bypass mainstream media. Uh, you know, my suggestion is that most people still read mainstream media when it comes to an election. But um, the information is balanced by, you know, uh, whether it's rumor mongering or whether it's, um, you know, the sharing of new information, the sharing of videos by uh, opposition. In fact, just last night or this morning alone, um, many of us would have received videos of, you know, people celebrating on the ground. Um, and of course, everyone became a safe distancing ambassador, pointing out that, you know, no one's observing. All of those things seem very frivolous. But I think they inform um, the voters of the broader sense of you know, what each party stands for. Um, now, whether that aligns exactly with their message uh, is another story. But um, I think people use that to think about you know, who they want to support, uh, who they want to lean towards, um, and, and those sorts of things. So, yes, we are seeing a shift. It's become more messy. But I think in any society where you have uh, a, a freer media, it, the, the messiness will always be there. And I think that forms part of the, the broader equation. So, um, I mean, early stages, this is the morning after. Um, I think there's quite a bit to, to digest and quite a bit of statistics to, to, to see through. Uh, I'd like to jump in um, by just mentioning that as I talk to various voters, um, various uh, anal fellow analysts and various political parties uh, in their use of social media uh, in these elections, I think there is a gradual growing sense of a general div divide, a generational divide, I'm sorry, uh, with regards to the different kinds of platforms that uh, different age groups use. Uh, so even within this broad category of internet and social media, uh, there's variation across different kinds of platforms, right? So number one, uh, we could see that um, people in their 30s and 40s, they will generally uh, gravitate towards Facebook. 
as the medium that they would use to communicate with each other. Uh, but people in their teens and 20s uh, would gravitate towards uh, using Twitter and using Instagram uh, to express their political opinions and preferences, right? So I think there was a sense that um, uh, Tan Ching Bok managed to create this uh, persona of being a very cute grandfather uh, because of the way he engaged uh, in like describing hype beast. Uh, to to his fellow um, uh, voters uh, on Instagram, right? So, so I think that that definitely is a generational divide. Um, and what this implies moving forwards into the future uh, will be very interesting to observe. And um, and so I, I can't really say anything for now. No, very very little research has been done on this generational divide. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, the generation divide, I think, uh, deserves um, a further discussion uh, yes. later on in, in our, uh, on our panel, but I'll stick with uh, social media uh, mm. specifically. I mean, I agree completely with you. I mean, as, as a medium scholar myself, you know, it's, it's with some shame that I admit that my field uh, hasn't actually gotten on top of this in Singapore, right? That is, um, uh, there's much more research being done, uh, even in our neighboring countries, about social media and elections, and about social media in Singapore. And let's hope that we catch up quickly, because obviously yeah. this is a, is, a, is a major development. Uh, for example, one thing we don't really know, but we have some sense of, is that it is, it is not really the case anymore that the internet belongs to anti-government forces, you know, far from it. Yeah? For, for several years, the... Um, the PAP and the government uh, and its supporters have invested heavily in social media capacity. Uh, and in fact, uh, to me, the surprise was the opposite. I, I was actually um, expecting uh, social media to be far more dominated by uh, pro-PAP forces in this campaign. And I'm still trying to think of think about why it wasn't. Because if you look at the period between elections, uh, I think it is fair to say that um, the PAP has already won the social media battle. So, uh, but why uh, wasn't it, um, why didn't it clinch the deal, so to speak, within the campaign? Um, I mean, I, I can only, uh, one, one theory brought up by um, uh, someone online, I think one of the people who, who uh, sent out a question yesterday was that, um, uh, that uh, well, it, it could be anything from um, the fact that the uh, opposition is just more creative online. Uh, it could be that the PAP are not actually doing it correctly. Uh, I, I think Priscilla, you had some thoughts on that, that, uh, that maybe the kind of um, internet brigades that dominate um, the uh, between election period uh, may not be the kind of thing that works during the campaign. Yeah, so I, I think I'll just make two points. I think the first is that the opportunities and the advantages that social media can bring is only as good as you are, as whichever party is, is most capable of able to seize that opportunity to its own advantage. So I think in terms of the opposition, if you look at opposition parties who have ran very good social media campaigns, they, relatively, they have a relatively high voting share. So I think the ability to seize that, 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 that media space to a party's own advantage is critical. And I think the second point is that with social media, what you do see is that the narrative is no longer dominated by one or two state actors. You see many different non-state actors coming into the scene. Um, you, I mean, the PAP Internet Brigade, one of them, but you also see a lot of people, a lot of different um, people whom you don't expect to be political, but I have also chimed in. Social media influencers, a lot of them have been actively speaking about this election and uh, on the things that matter. So that narrative now is more diverse and more plural and um, it will be interesting to see how, 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 how this will develop. Uh, but uh, Priscilla, sticking with you, I just want to check my hunch because of course the, one of the things that makes uh, social media research so difficult is that in effect we're all looking at different internets, right? Because of micro-targeting, because of the way we create our own bubbles, uh, 
And uh, my Facebook is different from your Facebook. Uh, of course, you're not you're too young to be on Facebook in the first place, but still, right? <laughs> but what is your hunch? I mean, is my hunch uh, correct that um, the uh, anti-PAP forces and the neutral forces were in, did in fact hold their own, or if anything, surpass uh, the uh, PAP social media campaign, despite the uh, fairly obvious fact that there is far more money behind the PAP's online campaign. Uh, would that be a correct uh, uh, hunch that, uh, that, that there was only so much that money could do? I think potentially in the sense that you see, um, and, and, and my reference point is really with a lot of different social media influencers. They don't have the type of money or resources when it comes to dealing specifically of, with um, social, uh, sorry, election type issue. But you see their views being extremely widespread. Um, people are sharing it on, on, a very, on a very extensive basis. So, I mean, it's really hard to tell now also because um, there are... I guess, I suppose, you, we will be able to make that comparison more if we had um, uh, Facebook pages that are pro PAB, for example, fabrications, um, uh, if they are allowed and if they, if, if they had that space to also um, post on their Facebook page, then you get a better sense of well, being able to see the comments, what people are sharing. So in the absence of that, I think um, the reality is more nuanced. Yes. I, I kind of hesitate jumping in at this point in the midst of two media scholars, but uh, the thing with media is, uh, is, is very simple. You, it's about messaging and how targeted and how efficient and effective the messaging is. So you can have a lot of money, you can have many, many platforms, but if your messaging is not clear, if you don't know what you're doing or you're trying to do too many things, yes. right? You're trying to, to, to put out too many messages. And, and social media is such that, you know, given the very short attention span that people have when looking at social media, you have to be very good and very targeted and to able to evoke those particular images or those particular uh, emotions in a given time. So, you, you know, so what, what it, it all depends on how... Uh, well, your media campaign has actually been uh, orchestrated. You don't need a whole lot. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I thought like, uh, you, you know, putting out video clips, uh, I particularly like the one that the uh, Workers' Party put out with the, with, 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 with the couple, uh, Terrence Tan and uh, Hurting You, right? Yeah. So there wasn't very much by way of this is Workers' Party message and, and so on and so forth. But it evokes a particular uh, message. It tells yeah. you that, hey, we are like you. We are young parents. We have the same challenges. We got young kids. Uh, we are sandwiched like you. And we are still trying to do this, right? Yeah. And there was this line, I think, uh, that Terrence uh, quipped where he says, ah, yeah, both, yeah. And, you know, you join opposition in Singapore. Nobody wants to marry you. I mean, it goes, it gives you a number of layers, a number of messages yes. in a very yeah. short time. And in a not offensive way, it's not in your face like I'm hectoring you, I'm telling you, I'm showing you how great I am. No, it's nothing like that. I'm actually being able to evoke a sense of identity with you, empathy with you, and, 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 and so sort of drawing your emotions, uh, hopefully, towards me as well. So this, this, this is effective campaigning, effective yes, yes. media strategy. Nothing to do with how much money and or special effects or whatever, right? Yeah, I think I think the sorry, I'll just chime in very quickly. I think the word I had in mind is authenticity or even perceived authenticity in the case of uh, you know for election campaigning purposes. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, agree a hundred percent, uh Terrence. So I mean from uh, I don't know about everyone, but from my point of view, the the videos and the con basically um I try to do a little bit of social media research myself, and the content that uh, the Workers' Party produced evoked much more of a sense of um, authenticity uh, within the candidates uh, to show to people like this is how they are, and this is just who they exactly. are, right? And um, 
they don't just repeat uh, talking the points that they, are, they are, that, that they are already trying to say, right? Okay, they don't go around just repeating no blank check, no blank check. They, they show you who their lives, what their lives are, how they, their journey and uh, you, you, as, as Kevin mentioned, you, you feel empathetic with them and you get a sense of like who they are as, as, as a people. Uh, yes. In contrast uh, with um, the, video, the content that uh, the PAP produced, uh, you get a sense that they are repeating certain talking points, right? It's yes. our lives, our jobs, our future. It's our lives, our jobs, our future. And there, there wasn't much beyond that uh, messaging. Um, and even for, for example, like, you know, the 4G leaders, and particularly Hing, uh, DPM Hing Sui Kit, uh, from all the content produced, I didn't really get a sense of like who DPM Hing Sui Kit was as a person. Like, who is he? How does, um, uh, how does his life experience inform how he, him as a person? I didn't get a sense of who the authentic Hing Sui Kit was. Right? Um, so so that, that, that was uh, just my sense of uh, judging from the content that was produced. Thank you for that, because you reminded me of um, the, the start of the campaign, in fact, prior to even the campaigning starting when the PAP new candidates were being introduced. And there was, there was a video that went around social media that talked about how chum all these people's lives were. Um, that contrived humility, if you like, uh, contrived humble background. And in some ways, we've had enough of that. You know, one of the things I pinpointed to, to Chan Chun Singh's, uh, the decision not to anoint him as a successor, it was about a year and a half back, right? Um, and so I made the comment to one of the media outlets that, you know, he's, he's, he's mentioning about his, he's overvalorizing his humble background one too many times. That I think many Singaporeans are quite sick of that narrative now. Um, so to continue to harp on that by the PAP already started uh, the campaign on a, an awful note. So yeah, that it was interesting to me to see back how, to the authenticity question. Yeah, that's right. It was, I mean, I thought I was fascinated to see how uh, quickly the um, uh, the the uh, humility uh, <laughs> narrative backfired. Yeah, uh, how quickly netizens saw through it. Uh, how quickly they were able to detect correctly or wrongly the, the lack of uh, uh, authenticity or, or perceived authenticity. Oh, that's and, right, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and again, that gets me thinking, you know, wait, uh, why did it happen so suddenly? And, and it's, but my hunch again is that um, the PAP is unused to this kind of uh, pushback because it doesn't normally get it in between elections, when in yeah. the truth is most Singaporeans are just turned off and apathetic and not particularly paying attention and not really even bothering to respond uh, to uh, PAP propaganda. Uh, and uh, it, so if I were to hazard a guess, I'd say that uh, a lot of what the PAP thinks works between elections, uh, it is only getting away with it because that not that many people are paying attention or even bothering yeah. to contradict them. Uh, but then, of course, with the in election season, everyone is t turned on in a very motivated way. And, and this takes the PAP by surprise because uh, stuff that may have worked, you know, even just six months ago, suddenly doesn't work during the campaign. And I, I, I feel that they were not prepared for that. But sticking with this, um, this very important idea that, that uh, Priscilla uh, raised, you know, which is that, look, you know, uh, no amount of social media is going to uh, make up for lack of substance in the end, right? Uh, can we spend a bit of time uh, moving away from image and talking about the substance of the message? You know, what, uh, what worked uh, for the WP in particular uh, and what didn't work for the, um, uh, for the PAP? Um, Elvin, do you want to take that? I mean, the, the, uh, the, the substantive calls that uh, both sides were making were pretty clear. I mean, you know, the PAP did have a strong substantive message. Uh, so the WP, so the SDP and so on, uh, they didn't work equally well. Yeah, I think if you look in terms of the substantive policies that the WP proposed, right? I would say, I would refer back to uh, Minister Vivian Balakrishnan's comment that uh, WP's uh, policies basically took 
uh, the policy proposals of the PAP and move half a step to the left. Actually, I think half a step is still little. They actually took one huge step, step to the left, right? And um, the very fact that uh, many voters voted for WP and w, uh, especially those in Sengkang also vo voted for WP. To some extent, it was also that um, the WP's uh, message uh, uh, substantive policy, policy proposals actually resonated uh, with voters themselves. And here I will point to potentially a couple of key proposals which uh, WP made, uh, which is number one, maybe the um, minimum wage proposal that uh, WP made, right? So uh, the PAP has always said that, you know, the, pro uh, the progressive wage model works for us and that is what we should go for. But the WP has consistently also said that, yes, that is good, but we also need to add in this minimum wage, right, to have that baseline for everyone uh, else. So I think a lot of people uh, saw that as an important thing because that kind of is a signal of the inherent dignity and work, uh, uh, inherent dignity of labor in Singapore, right, that you are not an exploited uh, undervalued labor uh, for your work. So, so that sets like a kind of uh, minimum bar. Uh, of course, there were other proposals uh, that WP had, such as the redundancy insurance, again, which the PAP has consistently said they are not interested uh, impl in implementing, but uh, the WP has consistently said that this is something that will uh, uh, be good to have, right? So um, in terms of substantive policy proposals-wise, I can definitely see that uh, the, the WP's left step proposal um, definitely resonated a, a lot more than the PAP's. Yeah, the thing, one thing that uh, didn't work for me in terms of this half step, what was meant to be an insult was that actually, to me, it kind of backfired because, you know, if the PAP is saying that the, WT, the, the WP's ideas are just a half step away, in, uh, implying that they're actually quite easy to implement, then my question would be, why isn't the PAP implementing them? I mean, it, it, it suggests that, in fact, uh, you know, the WP and people who support the WP are not asking for that much. So what's stopping you, right? Uh, so that didn't quite work for me. Um, uh, Priscilla, anything to add on the on substantive areas of policy? Um, I think for me, what really stood out for the WP was their ability to tell a good story and a good narrative. The policies mattered, but the values of each candidate and how the party values and how that translated into policies mattered. People cared that, that they stood for inclusive growth. They want to take care of every single person so that no one is left behind. And I think as much as the policies mattered, the ability to show where they stand, what they stood for uh, was very critical. And I think if we contrast that to the PAP, um, in, I mean, um, the manner in which they introduce their new candidate seems to also be um, not authentic as what Alvin mentioned as well. And um, it was also like what Terence said, a race to the bottom as to who came from a more poor circumstances than the other. And then you, um, then you leave voters kind of hanging. So, okay, where do you stand? What do you... What, 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 what do you stand for? How, how, is, how are you going to work for my benefit? How can I resonate with you? So I think that was the big contrast for me and why I think WP really did excellent in this social media internet election. Pick up on that point as well. I mean, I thought it was uh, very striking that uh, uh, Sylvia's um, final party political broadcast uh, was so focused on the values that Priscilla is talking about. And it wasn't uh, the traditional bread and butter issues uh, that uh, we associate with the Workers' Party, very much about the society we yearn for and so on. Language that uh, um, we don't quite associate with, uh, you know, this, this working class bread and butter um, uh, party. Uh, Kevin, anything to, to jump in on that? Yes, I, I wanted to uh, just, just make the point that um, one of the major disadvantages that the PAP had in terms of messaging was that there was already too much of it. Uh, 
when you had the whole lockdown, when everybody had really nothing else to do or could not do anything else, and you were focused yes. on news, going online and looking and reading at stuff, I mean, they are saturated with the PAP's message, right? Jobs, livelihood, our future, uh, you know, COVID-19. So you, 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 you have, in other words, they heard it all. Yes. And that's all coming from the government. So when you call an election in the middle of a pandemic and people are worried, they say, well, you, 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 I'm going to call this now. Uh, you better tell me something more, yeah, right? right? It's got to be more. And all you're doing is you're saying the same thing. Give me, yes. give me a, a mandate to do what I'm already doing. Yeah. Um, so after a while, people tune out, right? Because uh, I, I'm not hearing anything new. So the, no matter what you pile onto the, the, the equation, no matter how poor your background used to be uh, or illustrious your career is, it's the same story, right? Yes. Workers' Party offered a different story. Um, and it was a story that was not ridiculous, okay? In other words, yes, people want to hear alternative views. But, you know, I mean, and, and here I'm going back to really uh, ancient times in the last century where you had politicians <coughs> like uh, Haban Singh, for example, who, who, who at one time in his election campaign said, if I am elected prime minister of Singapore, I will abolish national service and I will make, you know, bus fares five cents no matter how far you go. I mean you make election promises like that, no way you could keep them, right? Workers' Party came up with something and that's why that half-step, one-step thing was really important because in that economic debate, I mean, Jameis made a point, we've done the sums, we've done the sums, there will be trade-off, but we can afford this. And this is what Singaporeans want to hear. Now, you know, that's what we do with our budgets. We juggle all the time. We say, well, look, maybe this year, right, because of these circumstances, uncertainty, let's put aside a bit more. We don't go for a holiday. We don't buy that new fridge or whatever it is. That's what we do on a normal basis. And so the Workers' Party was able to tap into that and say, well, you know, we, we, we are not, we're not, you know, throwing out the silver. We are just juggling things a bit to make it manageable and it's more humane. It's more idealistic. This is more the kind of, you know, kind of society that you and I want. But, you know, to, to put what you have said in, a, in another way, uh, Kevin, actually it is similar to the frustration that the PAP has often ex expressed that, look, they do the hard work in between elections. And of course that involves communication. And then these Johnny Come Latelys with their very novel message comes in and surprises us. And, and really all that's impressive about them is that they sound fresh and novel. Uh, and, and why are our voters so seduced by novelty? You know, shouldn't they be going for you know, the, the uh, tried and true uh, message, as, even if it's boring, right? Even if uh, the only twist that you can come up with uh, on jobs is to repeat it, say jobs, 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 right? Uh, you know, it is, <laughs> but that's still an important message. Where well, is is it uh, really to the WP's credit that they are merely novel? Uh, I, I'm going to just leave that aside as a comment, right? But uh, I think more interesting to me when it comes to the uh, work, uh, the PP's battle with the Workers' Party is how come the town council stuff didn't stick. I mean, this was such a major accusation made against the uh, Workers' Party. You know, it, 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 huge resources were invested, state resources, media resources, uh, into making the claim that the Workers' Party simply cannot be trusted. And yet it was a virtual non-issue in this campaign. You know, what's going on uh, with that, uh, uh, Priscilla? I, I, I was also quite surprised that the council, town council issue was not raised um, so much during this campaigning period. I think um, one, one, one potential reason might be the way the WP has been able to frame and message its um, responses to this, that they have been given um, the green ban in corporate governance by the MND. And that is a hard fact. That is, that is persuasive, um, it is an objective evidence as to their ability to manage the town council. And, um, and, and, and I think maybe that was, it, it was difficult to counter that narrative. 
In, in contrast, uh, I don't know whether you agree with this, uh, Elvin. I mean, I, the the mud that has been thrown at um, uh, Chi Sun Juan uh, seems to have stuck. Although he has he did a lot better this time than in uh, previous rounds. Uh, is he finally um, getting rid of that that uh, virtually twenty year old stigma? Um, whether Dr. Chi is finally getting rid of the um, 20 year old labels that the, w, the, that the PAP has, has thrown at him, um, it's quite speculative. I'm not really sure. Um, but I would say that uh, it seems that in general, the SDP still has a kind of a image problem. Um, in terms of its branding, right? Whether it comes across as being a little bit too aggressive uh, in criticizing the PAP relative to the Workers' Party, um, that, that may be it. Because if, if you take a look at the vote share, again, as I mentioned, uh, out of PSP, WP, and SDP, uh, the SDP seem to have had the worst, right? Uh, with regards to competing uh, against the PAP. Um, and also, if if it's not about Chi Sun Juan, uh, we could maybe perhaps have seen, uh, it, it, sorry, let me rephrase it again. If uh, the SDP's party branding were to be a little bit better, then perhaps we could have seen uh, Professor Paul Tambia being elected, right? If we get Panjang. Uh, but the fact is he did not, uh, he was not elected, right? So I think uh, before the elections, most of us were saying, well, if there was to be uh, one more or two more seats for the opposition, that it may come in Bukit Panjang because Professor Paul Tambia is uh, such a well-respected um, uh, doctor, right? So it, it goes to show again that when people want to vote um, for the opposition uh, party in their constituencies, um, it's a combination of all factors, right? Uh, it's not just any one single factor. Your party brand must be good. Your candidate must be good. And they must be authentic and compelling. Uh, so it is really difficult for the opposition parties to have all their ducks lined up in the row and say, I have this, I have A, B, C, D, E, whatever you want, I have it. And therefore, um, this is why you should vote for me, right? You, you miss out on any one crucial ingredient, like party branding for the SDP, so you might um, not be able to recover from it. Right? So, so that's, that's how I see uh, SDP's performance. Well, speaking of mud, uh, I guess the, the main victim of um, negative campaigning in this election uh, was uh, Raisa Khan. Yeah? I, I was thinking, I wonder if Ivan Lim would also qualify, but... Uh, uh, it wasn't eventually a candidate, let's put it this way, <laughs> among but all the was, candidates. He, he was <laughs> featured though, did people see? Uh, uh, paid the uh, biggest price reputationally, uh, although it ultimately didn't work at the polls. Um, I, I think that does deserve some, uh, some discussion. Who would like to go first? I, oh, sorry, I was just chiming, I apologize for that. I was just saying that Ivan Lim featured in the victory uh, comments that uh, Taman made, right, last night or this morning. Uh, I thought that was a bit of a surprise. I, I don't know what they have up their sleeves in regards to Ivan Lin, but, you know, I think we want to forget him, but they keep bringing him back into the frame. So this is a bit strange, I think, on the part of the PAP. Um, look, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, um, Sharon. I think my, my sense when Razor was um, rather brutally um, attacked um, was that or immediately, firstly, you know, you kind of go, oh, no, this is not good. Um, and, then, and then I realized I've encountered her before because she was a student here at Murdoch. Um, and in fact, was the guild president in 2015. So I have encountered her. I just don't know those encounters. Um, but I also felt that they've made the wrong move already very early on because um, the attack on her brought out the minority issues that they were not ready to, to confront. So I think immediately in one fell swoop, um, you have people remembering the Halima um, Yaakob presidency issue um, that was forced upon Singaporeans, you, you could say. 
Um, immediately, you also because of who her father is. You mean? But yes, that's right. That's right. So the links, um, you know, got closer than you would otherwise like. So in in some ways, it was not a clever move on the part of the PAP. And I think it also brought up the big issues. Remember, we talk about the um, the, the micro as well as the mega, the broader issues. Um, it brought up issues of the politics of race, which I think Singapore has not dealt with, you know, all these years in talking about race and ruling out race. You've actually brought it up to the fore much more. Um, and that was really not clever campaigning. by. Um, so then, of course, that sparked you know, it, it kept being on the radar because it sparked this whole slew of police reports, right? Um, which was funny in some ways, but it also brings the whole process of our politics down to, you know, if there's a word beyond gutters, um, that would be it. So I, it became extremely ugly. And I don't think any Singaporean um, rationally or even irrationally would like any of these things to be uh, part of the whole equation. Yeah, can I jump in here? Uh, you see, one of these problems with uh, character assassination, you start attacking somebody, is that I, I think uh, that that's something from an old PAP playbook from the last century. You may be able to get away with this, right? I mean, I remember the days when Lee Kuan Yew would attack somebody because, you know, his father was a bicycle thief, right? Uh, or something like that. Uh, you don't do that these days because number one, you know, I think people uh, would look at the individual and, and, and go beyond and then try and see if uh, there were other reasons why this particular person worked in a particular way. Now, I think one of the problems uh, that everybody faced in this election and actually boomeranged on the government was that you instituted POFMA you have a number of rules that are in play that seem uh, to be too convenient to use to silence your opponents, okay? Uh, I, I mean, I was totally mystified by the uh, correction order issued, you know, on uh, Paul Tambaya uh, and the NUSS and all the people who sort of reported on that event where he, he talked about what the MOM said. Everybody remembers what MOM said. It was there. It was there in the Straits Times. I mean, you know, uh, and yet, you know, you, you, you see that in play. So after a while, again, if you uh, uh, do this too much, then either it descends into this abyss, uh, which nobody wants to go. And after a while, people sort of get desensitized and don't want to look at that. And therefore, negates, negates the effect of the attack, right? Or you... Uh, or, or you simply ignore it and say, well, okay, look, uh, we're, we're not going to look at that. We'll look beyond. So I think uh, any party, any uh, internet actor wishing to make sort of this uh, ad hominem personal attacks has to be very, very careful because the danger of it boomeranging, uh, as it did the person who reported on uh, Raisa, uh, uh, happened, right? They actually uh, it may actually come back and, and hit you. Um, I would like to also add in to contribute my two cents on the significance of um, Raiza being now an elected member of parliament, right? So the, the very fact that she, Sengkang voters voted her and her, uh, her team in, uh, despite the mud that was uh, thrown at her to stain her, um, seems to me like a real significant indictment of the government's management of race and religious issues uh, in the country, um, particularly one could say amongst the younger voters, right? And younger voters are kind of saying that, you know, this is not how we want to work on race and religious issues uh, moving forward into the future. Um, and they are going to uh, stand by the candidate and we can see for ourselves uh, why she or may or may not uh, be credible, right? And I also want to doubly emphasize um, her position as now an elected member of parliament. Uh, I could be wrong, 
right? Um, but now she is the first ever elected opposition member of parliament who is both female and a Malay, right? And that is uh, fairly significant for uh, the Workers' Party where you have uh, someone who is young, uh, Malay uh, uh, lady for young people to look up to, uh, for people within um, potentially the minority community to look up to. Um, so a lot of eyes will be on her, on how she carries herself uh, in parliament. Um, although, of course, we shouldn't say any one person is representative of the community. Right? I'm not saying that at all, but um, I'm saying that in terms of uh, potentially being a role model uh, for the community, of course, nobody wants to have that kind of label thrown on them, but the potential effect may be that um, uh, people will be looking uh, towards her as, the, uh, as a kind of a, a role model moving forwards in the future. So I, I think her, her, her election as an elected member of parliament has, has a huge implication for the, for the um, racial minorities uh, in Singapore. Can I just maybe just quickly jump in? Um, I think what this, um, what Reza's um, in incident show is that for me, really, the dominant party no longer shapes the narrative and the narrative will be shaped in the next few years and now by ordinary people who are able to, to take, who wants to take part in this conversation, who want to talk about race and religion. They have very different views from or, or the younger generation, they have very different views about race and religion from older generation. And, um, uh, and, and, and it will be challenging, it will be messy, but I think from the looks of how so much discussion on social media have originated a lot from young people that they, 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 this, 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 this ability to be able to talk about race is top priority. And I think for me also, what was interesting is the police report. Um, they are, and you after after her incident, you saw many other individual citizens also taking, um, filing police reports against uh, Mr. Hing, the PAP. Oh, yeah. So we need to ask this which incident. police report you're referring to. <laughs> or, or, or rather, I'm just uh, probably just as as a general observation, um, how so many police reports have kind of sprung up as a result of this incident. Um, I think uh, for me, that was really interesting because um, it felt to me like people wanted to equalize the use of the law. That it should be equally applied to any particular single or a particular person. So I think that for me was quite interesting to see how people are using state mechanism um, to, to, to perhaps um, have some form of accountability. That, yeah, that's, a, that's interesting. So yeah, I think the, um, the tactic of using police reports, I think has rightly been criticized. You know, as, uh, do we really want a society where you know, citizens can't sort things out by themselves and instead going to run to the police and everything? But you're, you're making this uh, 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 a point that in fact, it is being used to send a message. We expect equal treatment. We're going to uh, give as good as we get. Yeah. Uh, it's in a, in a way, it's a setting a norm of uh, equality um, in, in perhaps uh, uh, an, an ugly way, but people should get that message that uh, Singaporeans demand fairness and equality. Um, uh, Kevin, uh, going back to this uh, uh, question of, of um, the police report made against her, you know, someone was asking me, wait, uh, What's to say that um, now that she's about to enter into, par into Parliament, she, she could actually be uh, charged and convicted? Um, is that a realistic prospect? Well, again, uh, investigations are ongoing. But from what we have seen, right, uh, it appears that the, uh, uh, the alleged offence or, or offences uh, 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 run afoul of uh, what is Section 298 of the penal code, or at least that was what uh, the allegation is, right? That she violated Section 298. Uh, and uh, all I, I want to say about Section 298, uh, Section 298 is about uttering words and so on with deliberate intent to wound the religious 
or racial feelings of any person. So it actually reads, and I'll just read the first part of it, whoever with deliberate intention of wounding the religious or racial feelings of any person utters any word, makes any sound in the hearing that person, makes any gesture and so on, uh, may be liable to this offence, right? Now, the key words here is deliberate intention of wounding. I mean, this is not uh, going to be easy to prove, right? Just from speaking from a strictly legal point of view, if I were going to go to court and prosecute somebody for this, uh, it, takes, it will be quite uh, uh, a task to show uh, what is in the mind of the person, what is in the... Uh, the so-called guilty mind, did this person have a deliberate intention to wound, uh, and not just wound any feelings, but religious or racial feelings, right? So you have to be very, very clear. Uh, this is what uh, proving the crime requires. So based on what we've seen so far, um, um, I think it will be an uphill task for the prosecution, right? But we don't know, right? They, they may have more stuff. Uh, yeah. Now, what will happen? I mean... It, yeah. Can I just interrupt you to bring in Priscilla again? Because as the only practicing uh, uh, lawyer, although Kevin, uh, you may have talked to her, I don't know, but <laughs> as the only one practicing law, but what, what do you think of that? That, that uh, could she be charged? Or, I, I, I think it's really difficult to see where the police, what kind of actions the police might take. But let's say they do charge her and she gets convicted. I think the question would be: Would she be disqualified uh, from running? And continuing her, her her membership in parliament, and um, under the constitution, um, there are several conditions where an um, MP becomes disqualified to continue with his or her seat. And one of the disqualification that is relevant for this situation is if um, she has been convicted of an offence by by the Singapore courts, and the sentence is a t either uh, for a term either of not less than one year or a fine of not less than $2,000. So, so it really depends. Um, we, we, we'll just have to watch and see what the police um, decides as their next course of action. My, my own hunch, uh, just based on precedent, is that at worst she would be issued with one of these stern warnings, right? Um, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the police just let it go. Yeah, uh, because uh, I think it was a bit of a stretch in the first place, as, as Kevin tried to, uh, to, po to point out. Um, I'm actually personally most heartened by the number of Singaporeans, uh, including the uh, Chinese Singaporeans, who were outraged by the PAP's uh, false statement, where they uh, said that uh, uh, she admitted to uh, making anti-Chinese, anti-Christian uh, statements which she never did, right? She 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 attacked what she saw as inequality uh, and injustice uh, by the system, by the police, uh, and in what she admitted was uh, too too heated and extreme a way. But she never did attack uh, Christians or Chinese, and and to let this out uh, to me was the single most disappointing. Uh, incident in the entire campaign. I'm just still stunned by it. Um, I wish the PAP had uh, simply retracted it because it was completely indefensible. But I'm glad in the absence of that, uh, so many Singaporeans uh, actually came out to say, we do not believe this ever happened. Um, so there is that, I think, that, that, uh, that uh, instinct among many, many Singaporeans to protect our uh, racial and religious harmony, which I think does bode well for us. I, I want to move on to the um, this this question that has been raised even in the um, in the course of talking about Raisa is uh, the, the supposed uh, generational divide. Uh, I say supposed because it is still a hunch. So just, we just feel there is something going on here. Yeah, that that the that the young are responding to the PAP's message uh, in a way that the PAP does not quite get. Um, would anyone like to take this on? I, I guess I should start with the two young ones, you know, Alvin and Priscilla. <laughs> do, do you think there is a generational divide uh, that is going to be as significant as, say, the, the class divide that we used to think of, uh, talk about more? Don't both rush either Alvin or Priscilla. <laughs> 
So with regards to the PAP and the use, uh, I mean, I don't, so to, to be honest, I'm not entirely certain about uh, what I'm going to say for now, but my sense is that there, there is a significant divide between what the use political views are and what they desire in the political system and what the PAP is offering. Uh, and there's a misalignment there, right? Um, it could be that uh, the young candidates that the PAP is bringing on is uh, not, um, uh, their views are not being filtered upwards into the party hierarchy fast enough. Uh, it could be that uh, the various feedback mechanisms from the young PAP uh, is not filtering around up into the party uh, hierarchy fast enough. Uh, and it could also be um, because there's a delay uh, in the uh, leadership transition, right? From the, four, uh, from the 3G leadership to the 4G leadership. Perhaps in a counterfactual world, if the uh, 4G leadership were to have already have taken over and if they would have to run a different campaign, perhaps the messaging that they're putting across might be might resonate more with uh, young voters right so so that could be uh, uh, something that is going on so there could be various uh, things going on I think the the PAP will have to do quite a bit of self reflection uh, with regards to their um, policies and outreach towards towards the youths Priscilla do you want to add to that well, I think across generations, we all have common goals. We want a better Singapore. Uh, we want our country to do well. But I think the differences lie in how we get there. Um, I, for, I think for the younger generation, um, there is a more urgent need. We want immediacy. We want to see change now. Um, we are passionate to see that, that move towards the time type of Singapore that we envision and we are willing to step forward, we are willing to speak up and we are willing to walk the talk and support whichever parties that best align um, with uh, our views. So I think, yes, there are generational divides um, and really the challenge is how to accommodate everyone in, in, in a single framework if, with multiple diverse uh, avenues to getting there. Yeah, and I will also very quickly want to put in a, a two finger to uh, one of the opinions that I saw in the chat uh, from Kai, uh, saying that it could be that uh, for the members of the young PAP that uh, the PP is recruiting, that they are particular that they may potentially be uh, from a similar pool of uh, young people who are better well off, uh, more higher income use. Uh, who are coming into the uh, young PAP, and therefore um, they may not be reflective of uh, the views of the uh, whole pool of youth out there. So that could be another potential explanation, um, which uh, will be interesting to look at. I mean, anecdotally, we know that the youth who um, participate in and volunteer for the PAP, such as uh, in their meet the people sessions, they usually come from uh, a little bit more well-off background, I would say, um, as compared to the to the median youth, right? So, so that could be a plausible hypothesis. So, the, there are uh, several um, major themes that we wanted to talk about that our audience also wanted to talk about, and we simply will not get uh, around to discussing, which include what are the implications of this result for the uh, transition to 4G, uh, what are the, what's the future of the opposition in terms of opposition cooperation, uh, what, the, what do these uh, results say about the GRC system and even the need for the system, considering that the Workers' Party team has three minorities, <laughs> and, and that once again the the uh, the, in, the senior Indian cabinet minister uh, scores exceptionally high uh, in his GRC. Uh, we've not talked about Pofma much, which is another huge innovation in this campaign. Um, so we have to be selective, and I think I'm going to just uh, pick on one theme to end. 
um, which has to do with uh, active citizenry. Yeah, um, because uh, one of our audience members, uh, Fani Kai, raises this, I think, very important point. What is the role of an active citizen in the periods between elections? Um, Justin Ong asks, you know, no matter what the result, and he was asking this before the results came out, how do we keep the conversation uh, going you know, for Singaporeans who feel sort of a bit more activated by the election, what next? Um, and how do we keep our elected officials accountable beyond this uh, intense period? Um, the, uh, and this, I think, is something I particularly feel uh, strongly about because in, in my view, and I think uh, Elvin, for example, and many political scientists would agree, you know, the thing about Singapore elections is that they are won before nomination day. I mean, the, the electorate pays attention during the campaign, but by then the game is over. There's so many structural and, uh, uh, and substantive issues that have been settled long before. Uh, the, and it's only around the margins that we are playing uh, when, the, when the time comes. Uh, so, so this idea of, um, of uh, keeping scrutiny on the electoral process or staying engaged with, uh, you know, as citizens, uh, seems to be crucial, but of course it is not really in line with uh, uh, Singapore's sort of elite dem democracy mode of government, where the, the, the uh, prevailing idea is that look, look let's leave uh, politics to the professionals, let's leave uh, policy making uh, to those who are really serious about it. Uh, uh, a bit of apathy isn't that bad because it just makes government government less messy. Uh, so, so really, leave the leave it to the people who know what they're doing. Um, you know, once every four or five years, pay attention, decide who you want to delegate the job to for the next four or five years, and in between, just go and do your work, uh, raise your families, uh, leave politics to us. Yeah. Um, some of us are not uh, persuaded by that model, right? <laughs> and, and we do actually believe in, in staying involved throughout. Uh, can this be done? Should this be done? And that's going to be my closing question uh, to each of you. Kevin, um, why don't you go first? Yes, thanks. Uh, I can't agree more with you, Cherian. I, I think as an educator, I've always believed that it's important Number one, that we need to educate, right? There's the, uh, you, you can't advocate for anything unless you have your facts, right? So you, you need to educate the, the, the voting population. This is extremely important. Now, some, some people may feel that this is a very dangerous thing, right? Because if you tell people too many things, they know too much about their rights, they know too much about the constitution and so on, they become troublemakers, right? Because they, they know how to navigate their ways in and out of these things. So I think education is key, right? Without education, without understanding the content of what you are talking about, what you're trying to do, uh, you, you, it's very hard to advocate because you, you may come across as, as being a little vacuous in that sense. And, and, and I think this came up in a debate, uh, during the debate where, which involved Vivian, uh, where somebody actually said, I can't remember if it was Chi or it was Jameis who actually said, look, you know, we don't have uh, a, a kind of civic education, right? Uh, the, the, you know, they, they, they don't talk about the pledge. I think it was Jameis. He said, they don't talk about the pledge. They don't talk about the constitution. Um, and I, I think one of these problems, of course, is that the government views this kind of education, this kind of talks, discussions, and so on, with a very suspicious eye. I, I, I remember once I was actually asked if I was joining the Workers' Party because uh, I appeared at a forum where they invited me to talk about the elected presidency. Uh, and they said, well, why do you go to the Workers' Party? And I said, well, if the PAP invited me, I would go to the PAP as well. Uh, but no, nobody does, right? So, so, so I, you know, I'm happy to educate whoever wants uh, to listen to me. But uh, so, so I, this is just a point to make that uh, we should take this citizenship education very very important and and don't penalize those who actually embark in this Terence? yeah thank you i'm exactly on the same page i'm an educator too and um things i've been harping on and some of my you know colleagues would know about this is is the idea of critical literacy you can insert media into critical media literacy or critical political literacy um, and I think that's in some ways 
still sorely lacking in the context of Singapore, precisely for the reasons that um, Kevin has outlined. You know, the government views these things with suspicion. Um, you know, the government wants to have the, the first and final say um, to most things. In some ways, and they also tend to try and contrive what active citizenship means in the Singapore context. So, you know, the last round, after every election, you know, matter of course, you have a Singapore conversation or whatever term they might call it. Um, and, you know, it's very likely that one will emerge um, within a year from now, from today. And what happens then is, you know, you feed information into this box and very little of that translates into outcomes, right? So, or even if it does, you know, we can't actually um, join the dots to where it originated from. So I think that broadly speaking, you know, the, the way to become active is for Singaporeans to keep a price of um, developments in policies. There's, there's no other way around it. Um, you know, we can't have a shortcut, you know, come back five years later and we'll immediately fill you in on what's been happening. Um, and I think that, that that line has been used to criticize particularly opposition members coming in. Um, the same isn't thrown to new candidates that the PAP introduces, you know, um, usually a few months before the election. So, you know, there's, there's no shortcut to active citizenship. I think people need to apprise themselves of, um, you know, policy developments and, and, and things both at the local as well as the broader national level. Alvin? Yeah, I think I would agree with the general sentiments of Terence. Um, uh, the, as I've gradually uh, observed the civil society over the years, I think I can see more and more people, uh, young people, becoming active citizens, uh, right? And they do have an open invitation from DPN Heng Sui Kit, who says that uh, he wants a democracy of deeds in uh, Singapore. So I think, you know, the, the, the demand for active citizenry and the supply of active citizenry uh, is gradually moving uh, upwards. Um, and, and that is healthy in Singapore. Of course, uh, uh, people could be more politically educated and informed. But what I see, the, the missing link is really the onus on the government to not see every deed that a person does as suspicious of intent mm. and out to bring harm to Singapore, right? So I think the government, I think it's the, on the onus of the government somehow to be more inclusive, more open-minded to uh, the different agendas that people may put up. Um, and so, and that could uh, shift um, uh, policy into the future. Right? Again, I want to point out uh, something that someone said in the chat that uh, apparently the young PAP um, had a climate policy paper and apparently there was a lot of bold proposals and consultation with civic society. But these uh, climate change proposals did not filter up into the party hierarchy and you know, make it to the party manifesto, right? Mm -hmm. So it already shows that there is a conversation going on that uh, some things are bubbling up, but it's just not reaching the higher ups, right? So I think the higher ups got to do a little bit more of a self-reflection uh, moving forward into the future. Priscilla. I, I think underlying all this question is one, a sense of frustration as to what we can do. And also, I think a lack of information what we can, of what we can do besides just volunteering for the parties that we want to see in parliament or standing for political election itself. But actually, there are, there are ways to get directly involved with parliamentary process. So I'm thinking of two main things. Um, number one, um, public petitions. Um, if you recall, Mr. Louis Ng did bring a public petition um, on the issue of single housing for uh, sorry, housing, house, better housing policies for single parents. So that's one way of getting directly involved. The other way, there are a lot of... Con before any bill or any legislation is passed, there is a consultation process um, that is uh, conducted by REACH where they actually invite the public to make submissions on proposed legislations that might come in force. So... Um, well, one, one, one interesting example, I think, was the Films Act um, in 2018 when they wanted to make amendments to it. Um, the consultation actually did result in the draft 
bill, um, taking off uh, some tweaks and changes to the draft bill um, that eventually in the actual bill itself. So there are means and ways um, to um, be more actively involved and um, I, I think people are just not doing so only because um, they don't know where to be looking up for and how to take part in this type of political process. Well, thank you. And I guess I would add to that, I think many Singaporeans actually overestimate the uh, obstacles in the way and, and we should be learning from uh, activists uh, like Priscilla and uh, um, academics uh, like those uh, gathered here and many other Singaporeans who actually do find their ways around, uh, you know, admittedly uh, uh, frightening minefields. I mean, the, the, they can be intimidating, but there are role models uh, in front of us about how, about how to get this done. Um, let me um, end uh, by thanking the audience on behalf of those of us gathered here and to invite you to continue this conversation uh, and also to, of course, continue reading, yeah, which is the root of uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the wisdom and education that uh, we should be uh, arming ourselves with as, as citizens. Uh, so I personally am looking forward a great deal to the book that, uh, that Kevin and Terence are editing uh, with writers like uh, Priscilla and Elvin and several others. Uh, and you can, of course, join us anytime at academia.sg. Uh, to get your fix of uh, slightly dense, but we hope still readable op-eds and many other discussions on issues of the day. Um, the idea behind Academia SG is to try to connect the academic community with the, the wider public sphere. Uh, too often in Singapore, they are quite separate, living in their own uh, bubbles. Uh, we believe that academics uh, should play a more active role uh, and that the public and the government should welcome that role. And academia.sg is part of, uh, is a small way to, uh, to make that happen. Um, uh, so support us by signing up for our mailing list. That's all we ask. Uh, stay in touch. And uh, we hope that you have enjoyed this conversation. Uh, have a good weekend. Thank you.